The following recording is a part of SCIF's Travels Path Forward series of online summits. To discover and register for future events, visit forum.skift.com. Okay, great. Good morning, everybody from Skift. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Travels Path Forward, Short-Term Rentals. Skift's series of virtual discussions are being hosted weekly as a rapid response of tactical ideas, analysis, resilience to the industry as it responds to this coronavirus crisis. Uh, we'd like to thank all of our incredible speakers today for sharing their time and perspectives. Uh, before we begin today's session, I want to remind you that there's just a few weeks left before the submission deadline for Skift Idea Awards, our annual awards program in innovation, design, and experience across the traveler journey. Applications from brands, agencies, tech providers are open through May 15th. Head over, head over to skift.com awards to see all of the categories and check out the application. Uh, back to today's topic. Uh, note that the, we, will, we will be recording this event uh, in interviews uh, for archival on our website, so you miss any of these discussions. Uh, we won't be taking Q&A via Zoom, but we will be monitoring the chat and have uh, integrated a few questions that have been emailed in. So uh, we'll try to get to what we can. So to kick things off, please join me in welcoming Editor-in-Chief of Skift, Tom Lowry. Thank you. And as Brian mentioned, uh... I'm Tom Lowry, I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Skift, and I want to welcome all of our speakers and our participants to today's online summit on short-term rentals. So as a way of background, uh, the Skift editorial and research teams really got a jump on the crisis, uh, starting writing about uh, the impact and potential impact um, on travel back in January. And I know it's a bit of a cliche to say that opportunities are born of crisis, but we are we're really seeing that here at Skift. For one, the online summit that you are participating in today is one of a series that was created when the crisis began and we'll continue to host those uh, in the months uh, ahead. Um, in addition, you know, we launched a live blog months ago to provide you with more immediate news and analysis around the clock. Uh, what's more, our uh, founder, Rafat Ali, uh, has created a, um, a sort of Q&A live stream that uh, we put up uh, at 3 p.m. on Fridays, that's Eastern time. Uh, the discussions are really focused on uh, the future of travel with a lot of leaders from the industry. Uh, and if that's not enough, we, we continue to put out our daily newsletters, one for Europe and Asia and one for the U.S., and we give a tease of our coverage every day with something called the Skift Daily Briefing, which is our daily podcast, which is available wherever you, you download your podcasts. Um, and also, I don't want to neglect the two uh, platforms uh, that we have at Skift. EventMB, which covers all things events, has been doing a phenomenal job covering the changes that are undergoing uh, in the events industry, as well as Skift Airline Weekly, which is our weekly um, aviation industry subscription newsletter, which goes out on Sunday night. So um, again, I wanna thank everyone for supporting our independent and uncompromised journalism um, and for all the contributions uh, so far and for those that uh, you may be thinking about for the future. So uh, a heartfelt thanks from all of us at Skift and with that, I'm going to turn it back to Brian. Thank Great. you. Thank you, Tom. Uh, so now we're going to kick off our first discussion. How is the leisure rental market preparing for the recovery? Uh, this discussion will feature the co-founder and CEO of Turnkey Vacation Rentals, John Banzak, uh, Senior Director of Global Trust and Safety, Expedia Group, uh, Kelly Barton, the COO of Meyer Vacation Rentals, Michelle Hodges, and will be moderated by Amy Hynote, Founder and Editor-in-Chief of uh, VRM Intel. Thank you. Thanks, Brian, and thanks, Tom. Thank you for having us. And we're pretty excited to be here. I see John's on, and Kelly, and Michelle can turn back on now. So I wanted to say um, thank you for letting us talk about the leisure side of the short-term rental industry. We're pretty pumped about it. Um, so even, even with everything that's going on, I one of the things that we see is that sometimes we get a little bit maybe brushed over with all of the emphasis on the urban rental side and the shared spaces that have been fueled by Airbnb. So 
welcome to the less sexy side of the vacation rental industry. Um, but not with this panel, they're extremely sexy. So just to save time, I'm gonna introduce these guys. So what we did today is we brought together one local, large local vacation rental management company, one multi-destination vacation rental management company, and one OTA. So I wanna introduce John Banzak. John is the co-founder and CEO of Turnkey Vacation Rentals. Um, Michelle Piper is the president of Meyer. She's actually the president of Meyer Vacation Rentals in Gulf Shores, Alabama, and in the Gulf Coast of Florida. And then we've got Kelly Barton, who is the, get your title right, is the senior director of Global Trust Health and Safety for Expedia Group. But Kelly has been with Verbo for about 15 years. Um, and we started about the, in the industry about the same time. So welcome, you guys. I really appreciate you being here. Thank you. Um, so, so I'm going to start out. So like the rest of the world, the vacation rental industry also um, came to a full stop with the global, national, and local shutdowns. But unlike the rest of travel, we've actually started to see leisure activity pick back up already. And so, Michelle, I wanted to start with you. It may perplex the rest of the world, but go Shores in Orange Beach, Alabama are open for business right now and actually have business right now. Um, judging from traffic, it looks like you guys have got a pretty decent occupancy kick in. What's it looking like for this weekend in occupancy? Absolutely. In terms of occupancy here on the Alabama Gulf Coast, it looks like we may actually surpass last year by the time the end of the month comes. Since we reopened our beaches uh, April 30th at 5 p.m., our occupancy has grown, we're in the mid 50s now, by the time Memorial Day comes around, uh, like I said, there's a real likely opportunity that we'll reach or exceed 19. For this, for this weekend? For, for the month of May. Okay, right. so compared so, to 2019 in May, you're projecting that you will actually meet 2019 numbers in terms of occupancy, absolutely. So for us, that's being a drive-to market. We have um, two main interstates that come to our beach, so the I-65 and I-10 corridor, and it makes it very easy for folks to get here. We're the closest beach for folks coming from the Texas, Louisiana area, and we're an easy access point for folks coming from Chicago South. So we're, um, we're an easy destination for folks who maybe are a little bit uncomfortable or hesitant to get in an airplane or make long travel. So for we're seeing a lot of short stays right now. Folks aren't really interested or quite comfortable booking further out. But for arrivals as soon as this weekend um, and into the next 15 to 30 days, we've definitely seen a big uptick since the 1st of May. So for you, right across the state border is Florida, and they're closed right now. The short-term rentals are closed there. And in case you don't know, um, the state of Florida is keeping hotels open and motels and timeshares and bed and breakfasts, but they've actually kept vacation rentals, short-term rentals closed throughout the entire state. And we don't really, it's an open-ended mandate right now, so we don't know when that's going to stop. Are you seeing a lot of traffic that may have been, may would have, excuse me, how do I say that, would have gone to Florida, but now they're coming to see you? Absolutely. And for us, we, um, we can just, the state line is almost seamless in this area between Alabama and Florida. So a lot of folks um, just come to the beach and that's a state line that is, um, like I said, it's rather seamless in this area. So it's, it's an interesting dynamic that in Perdido Key, Florida, we're not allowed to open up, but on the Alabama Gulf Coast, we are. We've seen in the last couple of weeks since we've opened, folks who had weddings planned or family reunions, folks who were just used to going to the Panhandle or those beach areas closest to us in Florida that aren't able to go to their normal vacation rental property. So they're looking for alternatives and they, they are ready to get to the beach. So they're starting to transition and research options in Orange Beach, Gulf Shores area. So we, we're definitely picking up some folks who don't want to give up their vacation, um, but can't get into their Florida property. John, you've managed properties in both these locations as well. Are you seeing a sim similar activity in the Gulf Coast area? We are. I mean, it's hard to say if people would have traveled to Florida rather than the Gulf Coast. For us, they, they tend to be a, a two separate um, consumer markets to some degree. But yeah, I mean, you can't go to Florida. 
right? And you can go to the Gulf Coast and guess what? The beach in the Gulf Coast is just as nice as it is in Florida and they're open for business. So people are going there instead. Are you seeing pretty high occupancy levels in your Alabama properties right now? We are, yeah. Um, we're seeing high occupancy basically in any drive market that's open that you'd expect to see occupancy in, right? You're not seeing it in the mountains because people don't go to the mountains in late April and May anyway, but you're seeing it on the beaches where people can get to. That being said, I just heard from um, some Gatlinburg property managers that they're also expecting a 50% occupancy weekend in the Gatlinburg area, which kind of leads to this idea of maybe there's some pent up demand in the drive to market. Kelly, from your perspective at Verbo and especially your knowledge of this industry, are you seeing some more demand for the leisure side of vacation rentals, standalone vacation homes than, than maybe you would see in hotel rooms right now? Um, well, not by comparison, but we did, uh, Verbo did recently speak with about 200 uh, travelers in the U.S. and the U.K., and more than three-fourths of them, they, they are likely to book a vacation rental. So we are seeing customers that do want to stay in a short-term rental. They do want to be with their, their families. Um, and, and drive to markets is not too surprising to, for me to hear uh, from these two experts, um, given, given there is some hesitancy you hear about in the news of people not wanting to fly yet. Kelly, one of the things that we saw is like on your, on Verbo right now, you can actually book a property in Florida on the site, but it's still not legal to be there. So are you guys kind of, as far as your policy right now, dealing with all these regulations, leaving it up to the property manager or the homeowner to block out their own calendars and not try to dictate that? Yeah, we're working with our government affairs team to make sure that we're staying on top of uh, the different regulations and because it can vary by state, county, province, country, uh, city. The, the, the variations are, are quite extensive. And so we are working with government affairs to make sure we understand where and what regulations are happening and then informing partners to make sure owners and managers make sure that they're aware of it if they aren't already, encouraging them to make sure they're following all their laws. John, how are you managing the different regulations across? You have, you're in what, 150 markets now? Yeah, well, we, yeah, and in, in every market, you know, the, the regulations can vary um, by zip code or block. It's not just one market. And we have to manage them all. You know, we, we kept our entire staff on board so we've got people out in the local markets who are, are taking care of it. And we're, we're really not having a problem tracking it. Um, uh, it can be a challenge to open up or close thousands of units, depending on the rules. You know, you saw what happened in Florida last week. There, there was a day or two where it seemed like vacation rentals may be allowed. So, you know, owners wanted them open. And then it seemed like that was going to pull back. And uh, so, so it's a bit of a juggling act, but I, but I think we're handling it pretty well. And our technology is pretty well set up for it. So I'm curious, in the Southeast, we've seen this real um, desire to travel. In the Northeast, are you seeing that same thing in those drive-to markets like Maine or the Cape? Um, that we are. are. Um, so in, in the past seven days, our bookings are up over 20% year over year. Right. So compare that to about a month ago when we were basically you know, not bringing in any intakes. But system-wide, our numbers as a company across the country are up 20%, um, which, is pretty, which is pretty amazing. Now, most of it's focused on the markets that you would assume. Um, but really, any drive market that is open is seeing a ton of demand um, right now. Um, so, you know, like Michelle said, closer in, um, but, but great demand. Um, I think there's a lot of, you know, we've got a lot of work to do in finding out whether or not who's going to travel. Is it going to be the 70 plus grandmother who books the multi-generational home? Um, but before we get into that, I want to talk about the, the cleaning side of this, this housekeeping piece, because it seems to come up a lot, you know, in, in terms of when people are asking us questions about the industry. Um, are you making adjustments to your housekeeping policies right now, Michelle, to to kind of address consumer needs? And do consumers have questions about your housekeeping? I will tell you that going through COVID and preparing and anticipating reopening um, or reopening rentals and the beaches, I really thought that there would be a lot of phone traffic, that consumers would want to have conversations and, and hear a lot of detail about what I call the back of the house, that not so pretty side of the business. 
Um, and I've been shocked in the last seven days or so, the number of folks who are just going to the website and booking. They're not, um, they don't have the need that I thought they would for a, a one-on-one -on -one conversation and a lot of detailed conversation about what the cleaning processes are. Now, we did implement um, a landing page on our website and what we're calling the Meyer Clean Shield that communicates what our training processes are for housekeeping, the chemicals that we're using, the way that we sanitize properties and linen. So we're giving them all of that information that prior to this, um, we had in place, but we didn't communicate a lot about because, again, it's not the, the pretty side of the business. So um, to, to that regard, we're, we're communicating it on the site and, and maybe answering questions and just giving a little bit of peace of mind, um, but it, it has not been the conversation at this point that I thought it may have been. John, um, same question to you, but also add to that this whole idea of a buffer time. The Airbnb has introduced this 24-hour buffer period, which is a window between stays that no one's entering the property. Um, I, I'm curious about your opinion of that, too. So changes you've made to your housekeeping processes and how you feel about the 24-hour buffer. Yes, yeah, so we rolled out changes several weeks ago. Um, you know, all of our homes uh, are wired into our GuestWorks cleaning platform, and uh, we began requiring housekeepers to use approved COVID fighting products. We added some steps to the clean, wiping down surfaces, doorknobs, uh, cabinet knobs. We even required them to take a photo of the actual cleaning products that they brought to the home, and those photos are reviewed by human eyes um, within a couple minutes of them being taken. Um, so pretty big changes. Um, you know, that said, talking to consumers, well, one thing that keeps coming up is that if I'm really concerned about cleanliness, it's pretty easy for me to bring my own Clorox wipes. And the second I get to a home is to wipe down the knobs myself, right? Um, so if someone's really concerned about cleanliness, a vacation home is actually pretty easy to deal with. Um, so we've launched all of that. And then we have implemented a 24-hour buffer for now. Um, and, you know, I, I think there's been a lot of um, hype about it. On the consumer side, I do think there are benefits. I'm not sure that are as, as big as people think. I do think there are some benefits. On the revenue side, when you're seeing three and four night stays, um, the buffer doesn't hurt you too badly, right? Uh, if you think about how many gaps there are, how many orphan nights there are already in the system, it, it's not like an owner's losing a night for every stay. And, and that's what we're seeing now with these shorter stays is the buffer hasn't been an issue if you've got, especially if you've got someone who's doing a weekend stay. Um, but we'll, we'll monitor it, right? We've got some owners who don't like it at all, quite frankly. And, um, you know, clearly at Turnkey, hey, we want to do more revenue too, right? It's not like we're excited to get rid of these. At the same time, I think if, if you're a guest and you see a home that's guaranteeing a buffer, you're probably more likely to, to book that home than if you're seeing a home where someone could have checked out literally a couple hours before you got there. So for now, we're going we're gonna to implement it and, and see how it goes. So if you're supporting the 24-hour, you know, Florida is proposing 72 hours between stays. Um, would you do that as well in Florida? No, there's no, there's no logic behind that. Um, it, it's, you know, virtually, um, you know, no science supports a 72-hour buffer. Um, and competitively, it, it just doesn't make sense, right? The owners will, 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 will be crushed in terms of revenue and guests won't get a benefit. Kelly, um, at Verbo, are you guys on the 24-hour bandwagon with Airbnb? <laughs> well, I think what we're trying to do more than anything is make sure that we're staying aware of what the CDC, World Health Organization, and other professionals are, are guiding towards. We've been working with uh, Dr. Daniel Lucy, who has over 25 years of, of experience in infectious diseases uh, control in the Society of America. Um, so we are we're trying to walk that careful line of balancing between partner and traveler needs um, and, and just really providing education and information to everyone that they can make it what makes the best decision for them and for their families. So are, is Verbo recommending 24 hours between stays to, for extra cleaning time? We're establishing minimums based on what the CDC and the World Health Organization and uh, Crystal International Standards is providing to us. 
which we expect could be 24 hours today, it, we may see a change. It, it may also vary based on, like John commented on the state of Florida being different. Uh, different countries also have different limitations and minimums. So I, I'm trying to understand right now for your property managers in the United States, are you recommending yeah. 24 hours between states today? Yeah, we have not come out and published that they are required to do anything about 24 hours. Michelle, what have a buyer stance on this buffer policy? So in April, when um, we were limited to essential travel only, we implemented, a, for our, the peace of mind of our housekeepers, predominantly, a um, gap between stays. Our occupancy in April was single digits. We um, had very few folks coming. So right now, in Alabama, we actually have um, we have back-to-back -back bookings. We're doing turns, so that's one of the reasons why it's important for us to communicate what our products are and what our processes are and how we're cleaning, how we're preparing those units. We obviously want our guests, our residents, everyone here to have peace of mind that those properties are and always have been cleaned and sanitized in between stays. Um, you know, as far as cleaning products go, we have ordered our products in 55 gallon drums. So we're not running out to Sam's or Costco and relying on those grocery stores for our cleaning products. We have those in mass. Um, they're all OSHA regulated and um, EPA approved. So the safety, the security of those products and what they offer in terms of making sure that product, that property is ready for the next guest to check in is an important communication piece for us. I want to talk about cancellation policies for a second. Kelly, the survey that you guys are about to put out, that we got a preview of, says that people are more likely to book a vacation rental with flexible cancellation policies. What is considered a flexible cancellation policy for Virgo? I mean, overly simplified, it's anything uh, other than non-refundable. Um, but we do, you know, travelers are looking for something that gives them that flexibility, giving them some time to book something in advance. Um, and then be able to cancel and get some type of, of refund, either, either a partial refund or a full refund as they get closer to stay. But anything less, anything other than non-refundable. JV, you kind of became a, a battering boy socially for some of these cancellation policies. I feel for you, my brother. Um, tell me, like, first of all, how did you come up with your policy and are there things you would do differently? So our, our policy that we got battered for was issuing credits. And no, I wouldn't do it differently, right? As we've said countless times now, we have to balance both owners and guests. And while I feel for the guests, um, I lost several thousand dollars on the trip I didn't take myself for spring break. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I got to balance the owners. And I'm giving guests a better deal. They signed up for a completely non-refundable trip. They didn't buy travel insurance. Um, and instead, we gave them a credit. And you know what? 95% of guests are completely fine with that. Um, and we're happy with that decision. They think it's fair. Owners appreciate it. Um, as far as the, the VRBO survey goes, look, of course, everyone would prefer a flexible cancel policy. Who, who wouldn't, right? Um, but that comes at a cost. There's a reason that Southwest Airlines charges double for the same ticket to get a fully refundable ticket versus their credit policy. It, it, it's just that expensive. So as a supplier, we're not going to do that. Right? I, I'm not going to sit around and, and look at ghosted inventory for a month and hope that someone shows up. My recommendation to guests is if you really are concerned, then just book it last minute. Wait and take your chances. Right? Um, there's availability out there. It's, it's not like you're going to get to the, the moment for travel and, and not find it. So just wait and take your chances. And, and you may have to sacrifice the home that you get. But from a homeowner perspective, I can't be sitting with, you know, thousands of book nights and expect them to disappear. Owners just won't tolerate that. So, John, about Airbnb, obviously they, um, they took a pretty hard early line on cancellations and, and refunding and kind of were all over the map in their policies. Had, did they affect you at all and how you were able to handle your guests? They didn't necessarily affect how we were able to handle our guests. Certainly guests brought that up and they said, right, um, you know, Airbnb let me refund and, and, you know, you can, you can book on Airbnb and, and get those benefits. You're going to pay a service fee, of course, to get those. Um, but it didn't really, it didn't really um, you know, hurt us in any way. Um, you know, it hurt us on the supply side, right? Having to explain to owners that they're not getting their revenue, just having to track it 
figuring out which ones qualified, which ones don't, you know, it, it still is a, is a huge task for our, for our guest experience and accounting teams every day, just to, just to sort through it all. Michelle, how are you forecasting for the rest of the year? Average daily rate. Do you think that rates are going to go up or down this year? And do you feel like you're going to, how you, where do you think you're going to be sitting in occupancy by the end of the year relative to 2019? Sure. So um, it, I think the rest of the summer, for us, of course, in this market, our peak is summer, so we're heading into that season. Um, I feel like it's going to follow what we've seen over the last week. And just based off the guest phone calls that have come in and the communication that's taken place, folks are – still nervous that we're going to be allowed to travel, that there won't be an additional travel ban placed or that there won't be a reoccurrence of what we have been through. So for those folks looking at June and July and into the season, they're searching, they're certainly dreaming, they're identifying what might fit their needs and what they might want to have in a vacation property, but they're a little bit hesitant to go ahead and make the commitment. They're either scared that one of their family members won't be able to get flights to get here if they're coming from further away, or again, that their, um, their home base location or our destination will issue some sort of ban and it'll disrupt their plans. So we're seeing a very short booking window. Um, like I, I mentioned earlier, anything from next day to the next 15 to 30 days. And I think that that window is gonna see us through the summer. So I am very optimistic that we'll have the occupancy numbers or close to that we would like to see in the summertime. Um, but because of that last minute booking window, I think that we will have an impact for our ADR at least in the summer of 2020. Um, but I also think that we're gonna have a great shoulder season that maybe we're not quite used to. Again, because of the tribe two destination and the ease of access, and the amount of folks who've really come through this with a, um, a, a, a sense of value for that family time and wanting to, to have those little weekend getaways. John, quick question about Google before we sign out. Um, looks like they're moving forward. We're talking to channel managers about, you know, getting connected. They're working actively to get more API connections to your properties. Do you think Google is still a, a threat to Expedia and booking right now, and do you anticipate using them more in 2020? Yeah, so we went live in Google's VR search directly, um, boy, like March 15th, um, right when volume kind of cratered. Um, but um, yeah, I do think it's a threat. Look, I mean, they're, they're, they're driving a ton of volume to us now. And, um, uh, you know, the, the way that you manage that product is really transparent, um, and it's branded, and it's direct, and we like that. Uh, so I, I don't know why it wouldn't have an impact on those sites. And, um, you know, they're, they're great to work with, too. Um, the product works well. So I, I think you'll see it start to expand. Um, it, it's not easy to connect to, and there's some pretty stringent requirements around performance. Um, so I think the rollout will be slow. But for now, it's, it's, been, a, it's been a great addition for Turnkey. Well, I hate to do this because I could talk to you guys all day long. I really appreciate you taking the time to do this. Um, Michelle, John, Kelly, um, thank you. And I will turn this over to our next um, panel. Thanks, you guys. I appreciate Thanks, it. Amy. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, everybody. And we're going to launch a brief poll on Leisure Travel right now, uh, which you'll see popping up on your screen as I introduce this next discussion. Uh, so you can go ahead and start voting on that. Um, great. So. Next up, we have a discussion on post-crisis tech pricing marketing strategies for property managers. This discussion will feature the CEO of Guesty, Vera Schwartz, uh, founder and CEO of Rented.com, Andrew McConnell. And the moderator will be Senior Research Analyst at Skift, Ryder Kurtz. Thank you very much and thanks everyone for joining. So yeah, we have, we have a great panel uh, coming up now. Two great panelists uh, with, a, with a wealth of information and experience. Um, that have really been supporting the industry, I think, the sector, as well as obviously, especially um, property managers. Um, just to quickly introduce them. Um, so we've got Vered, um, she's um, from the CEO, COO at uh, Property Management System, uh, Guesty. Um, 
I think at every event that I go to um, for this sector, she's there, she's speaking, so she clearly has a ear to the ground. So I'd love to hear what you have to say today, uh, Verit. Uh, thanks for joining. And um, we have Andrew McConnell, uh, CEO of Rented.com. Um, uh, I think I, I would say it's a revenue management system, but I think that would be um, not fair because I know it's it's a lot more than that. It's a, it's a full solution. And um, I know that you know the industry in and out and, and you've been around for a long time as well. So again, thanks, Andrew, for joining as well. And I can see that um, clearly both of you are doing a competition of, of best virtual backgrounds, which I wasn't invited to, but um, thanks for that. Um, anyway, let's, let's start. Um, so we have, as we heard in the previous session, we, we've seen a bit of uptick maybe in, in bookings. We actually have a slide, if, if we can pull that up. Um, some great data from um, a key data dashboard. Um, thanks for, for, for the folks over there to, to share this with us. Um, this is very much top level data, right? For the US um, um, on the right and, and Europe on the left. Just looking at, at bookings, as you can see, there's, there's some uptick, especially in the US, but obviously there's a, there's a lot more nuance to it than, than that. So I'd love to hear from both of you, actually. I know that Andrew, you're very well positioned to especially speak about the US. Uh, very, I mean, you, you're all around the world and, and, and I'd love to hear um, just just from both of you, and, and maybe we can start with you, Andrew, because our last session was very much focused on the U.S. Yeah, um, what you're seeing in the market today? I I think we're seeing with bookings with markets uh, kind of a parallel to what we're seeing with COVID in general, in that the impact and the recovery is completely uneven. And so, whether it's the U.S. versus Europe, or even within the U.S., it the the intricacies are really at a micro market level. And I think that that last panel uh, with Michelle, with John uh, at Turnkey in the breadth of areas they cover, the drive to markets really are experiencing this very, very different. And even the US, within the US, it, it, not to get political, but there really is a kind of Republican Democrat state divide in terms of where you're seeing bookings spike uh, versus hold back, largely because of policies being put in place. So, you know, you have governmental regulation as one piece, you have consumer sentiment as a, a second piece, and then a third piece that I haven't really heard anyone talk to uh, on what we're gonna see coming out of this, but is the economic impact. As we have 20 plus percent unemployment, does it matter how much people wanna travel if they don't have the means to? And what does that mean for the medium and potentially long-term for the industry? Really interesting. Barrett, what are you seeing from all the different properties and property management managers that you work with around the world? Yeah, so it's interesting because we have data from 80 countries and uh, we've actually seen COVID-19 begin in APAC, move to EMEA and, and then uh, to the US. Um, and I can see we've seen... Uh, recovery as of yet, but we are seeing a lot of optimism going forward, meaning if we look at um, reservations going forward to the fall and winter this year, uh, it's very similar to the numbers we've seen last year's, also in terms of occupancy per listing, not just general numbers. Um, so it doesn't mean that everything will be fine by fall and winter, but it means that at least travelers are optimistic about it. They believe they would be able to travel in fall and winter. They believe uh, that um, they should make reservations. Uh, we've also seen the length of stay double uh, for the short term uh, and not double, but still be expanded for the longer term for fall and winter. Uh, for the short term, I think it's uh, obvious it's due to the 14 days quarantine restrictions. It, it's due to getaways, people that are you know, going out of the city, taking it home even for a month because they don't have to go to work every day anyway, and they want to have a nice scenic environment uh, with their family. Um, but even for the longer term, we believe a lot of people are saving up their vacation days. They're not going on spring break. Um, so they're going to have a longer vacation, hopefully, uh, by fall time or in the holiday season. We actually have seen an uptick for reservations um, in Thanksgiving and Christmas and New Year's, um, meaning a lot of people are at least 
hoping and planning uh, to have longer vacations in the second part of the year. Interesting. I mean, I think we, we actually have another slide um, again from, from Key Data Dashboard, um, which, which just looks at the type of properties. Um, and, and you can see that, that larger properties are, are seem to be performing better. Um, I mean, what, what are your thoughts on, I mean, you, you mentioned longer stays there, which, which I think is very interesting. Um, it, it seems that maybe um, larger groups. Do you think, are you seeing any changes or, or do you have any view of, of changing demographics of users of, of short-term rentals? And would there be any longer lasting uh, impacts that, that this crisis is having? Either of you can shout what you think. <laughs> Just one thing on the, the demographics and larger groups, what we're actually seeing is even though people are pushing to larger homes, they're going with smaller groups. They mm -hmm. want the extra space. They want, they're not traveling with multiple families right now, uh, but they are looking, especially because occupancy is lower and they're planning to stay for a longer time that whereas they may have gone for a week for spring break, now they're planning to go for a month to really escape an urban environment they're looking at a five bedroom versus the two or three that they may have gone for the same size family. Mm, interesting. Yeah, I, I agree with Andre. I think it's uh, okay if I have to do this, at least instead of having a two bedroom, let me have a spacious environment with a little garden for the kids to play in. That's definitely uh, uh, something we're seeing. Uh, in terms of demographics, um, definitely for the short term, uh, as, as mentioned in the previous panel, um, and, the domestic travel is what's really uh, holding uh, short-term rentals now, uh, which means that you need to cater to your local audiences. Uh, those are people that might have planned a vacation uh, internationally and changed to a domestic uh, vacation uh, because of COVID-19. Um, and it also might be a different type of population, uh, such as actually people that are working and are looking for a different setting to work at. Um, we are working uh, with our clients uh, to encourage them to take different marketing tactics uh, to appeal to those demographics. So uh, actually go to even local communities, Facebook groups, uh, local newspapers, really understand how they should appeal to those uh, local people around them that uh, would be interested in a short-term stay and probably haven't considered it before. Yeah, and, and Andrew, you, you mentioned um, um, obviously declining occupancies. I think in the previous session that was mentioned a lot as well, and, and it's not, not a surprise. And, and I'm sure as we go through, through this crisis over however long that might be, occupancy will probably fluctuate a lot. Um, what, what are you seeing from a pricing resilience point of view? Have, have prices dropped? Um, are, are people or, or the property managers, are they, are they having any knee-jerk reactions or are they quite resilient when it comes to pricing? And then on, what, what, what are you seeing there? What we're actually seeing is people holding pricing a little better than maybe in the past. I think a lot of our clients may have been around 2008, 2009, 2010, and saw that being overreactive on pricing then, uh, it took about a decade to earn back. Yeah. And when you're in a market where the reason people aren't booking has very little to do with price, right? If you're concerned, you may put your family in physical risk. Discounting from $200 a night to 150 is not the thing that's going to change your mind on if you're booking a vacation. And so I think what Vered's talking about uh, a lot is changing who you're marketing to. And this is one of those instances where I think it, it is a little tougher for the OTAs. You know, there, there's, scrolling back on investing in marketing dollars, the active search for vacations and on those platforms has gone down pretty dramatically, but especially on the professional side, they have prior guests. They know where these people live and going back to prior guests saying, Hey, you missed spring break. Would you like to go ahead and go ahead and book something for coming up on the other side of this? It's really reframing. I think how a lot of these managers are thinking about, targeting guests, acquiring guests, and, uh, and marketing to them. Mm. And, and on, on your screen, on your screen now, sorry, Vera, on your screen now actually is, is a slide that, that we, we ask you some, some, uh, to provide some, uh, I suppose, tips or, or uh, ways that, that property management managers should be marketing their properties now. You, you, you 
you gave us a, a very extensive list. I mean, we, we talked about a few of these, but can you just go through a little bit more about where you think, um, what, what, should, what should property managers do now in, when it comes to marketing um, and their properties in this time? Yeah, so as I mentioned earlier, um, promoting to the right channels, understanding that the audience is mainly domestic uh, and focusing on what is important for their domestic audience is important. Uh, we saw a lot of our clients highlighting uh, the cleaning processes. I know that um, in the previous panel, um, they talked about the fact that it wasn't asked a lot uh, by clients, but we found that with our clients, it was very effective. Uh, to actually highlight the safety and security and the fact that you have ownership of cleaning your own space and they actually provide uh, sanitizers and masks and gloves and they even highlight that in the description of their property. And a lot of our clients have actually changed uh, the description of their listings to highlight uh, the COVID-related uh, facts such as uh, enhanced cleaning, no touch, the fact that you don't have to meet anyone, automatic check-in, keyless entry, all those issues all of a sudden uh, are important for guests. And then of course, think of why does the local consumer want to travel uh, to a short-term rental? Um, is there any local activity that's still open, you know, subject to the local regulations that you can highlight and say, hey, instead of going abroad, there is this, you know, show, there is something that's happening this weekend and you should come over. Um, even um, thinking of additional amenities about um, shipping groceries to their doorstep, anything related um, to the concerns of uh, the coronavirus. Interesting. I mean, we, we could talk about this for, for a lot longer, and I know, but we don't have that much time, sadly. Uh, let me just, in the final, for the final question, let me just um, switch a little bit. Um, both of you um, are in the tech space. Um, you're supporting property managers. What, what are you seeing in terms of um, the, the, the uptick of, of technology in the space? Are property managers asking you for more um, 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 guidance or, or new solutions um, better features I don't know or are they are are you are they dropping tech because it's one of the first things that they can can save some costs on would love to have a slightly honest answer um, on that just as a final final point yeah I mean for us it's like everything else, it's not even. And, and there are really two main camps. There's the turtles that you kind of go into your shell. It's a nuclear holocaust or nuclear winter. You're like trying to just survive. Um, and the issue with those is you may survive what's going on around, but the world's moved on by the time you come back out. And then the other side are the magpies. And they are building a nest. They're looking out at what's there right now. And so they may have something like a property management software where they've been on a legacy system that doesn't integrate with the channels they want to book on, that doesn't integrate with the technology they want to integrate with. And they're saying, hey, while bookings are slow, while things are slow, this is an amazing opportunity to set my business up how I want to operate in the 21st century, in the 2020s and beyond. And so it's, it's not everybody doing one or the other but it, they really do largely break into those two camps. And it, we've, we've certainly launched a number of products that are kind of temporary to help people navigate through this, right? My background's in consulting. Uh, Cliff was a bankruptcy attorney, our CFO had experience. So we're just helping advise clients to just stay alive to get to the other side of this. That are one off on technology. There is certainly R and D on seeing how people may be trying to move more to variable costs instead of fixed costs, maybe more automation and fewer uh, headcount internally. But the, the ones that are really looking for the other side of this, we do see them weighing things like Guesty and other property management software to say, how do we establish our business to be what we want it to be coming out? Yeah, I agree with Android. We see similar trends. Uh, you completely honest when this began we said oh my god no one will want to buy software right now but it's not the case a lot of the um a lot of the prospects are looking uh, to improve their technology at this time saying all of a sudden i have the time to do migrations to explore 
to do my research, um, and also thinking of how to be more effective, right? How to, we're all talking about reduction of, of costs, right? How can I automate uh, more functions? How can I create more bookings by being connected to more channels that I didn't connect to before? Uh, so actually, uh, Guesty helps a lot of those needs and concerns at this time. And we see uh, a lot of uh, interest from our clients. And, and we also help the existing clients uh, really uh, take advantage of everything we provide. For example, we have our advanced analytics tools and we created special uh, coronavirus related dashboards to give them more clarity and visibility on how this is impacting their business, what they could do, especially if they're in multiple locations, what are their, you know, the, the impact that we're seeing and how do they really apply domestic um, marketing tactics compared to international uh, marketing tactics, et cetera. So, um, I do believe that in the day of, at the end of the day, the strong will, will get stronger. We'll see consolidations. We're already starting to see also some consolidation of small players saying, you know what, this is really uh, too risky for me. I don't have the capacity and they're selling off to larger players. And we think that the, the professional stronger ones, most of them, not all of them, unfortunately, there's also a difference if you're, you know, uh, a lease to rent model or really just managing on behalf of owners or other models that we see around. I don't want to get into that in two minutes, but I uh, believe that um, a lot of the professional uh, will just become more professional through technology. Mm, that's a, that's a, I think a discussion for another day I hate to do this. I know we can talk a lot longer about all of this, but um, thanks both very much for, for taking your time today, joining us here. Um, Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. So next up, we are moving directly into a discussion looking at the urban market. Uh, this conversation will feature Sonder co-founder and CEO Francis Davidson in conversation with Skift executive editor Dennis Shaw. Francis, how are you doing? Thanks for being here. Hi. Pleasure to be here. Great. Uh, let's get right into it because uh, I have a lot of questions. Um, but first, can you briefly just, uh, you know, Sandra had to make a lot of tough decisions, as did probably every company on this call. Can you just give us a brief update about where things stand right now? Um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there's a lot to say about uh, where the business stands. But, um, you know, we've gone from uh, crisis mode over the last couple of months to try and just mitigate the impacts of the demand drop. And, and now kind of as a company are, are, are turning to the future and starting to think about what the next 18, 24 months looks like. So I'm, I'm sure we're going to dive into specifics um, during the conversation. But uh, yeah, well, I think we're at an inflection point where things have mostly stabilized and we're all looking to the future. Great. So I know we can't talk about funding. There was a story about uh, a pending funding deal. Uh, the one thing that was public was that uh, Lawrence Tassi, his Westcap company, former CFO of Airbnb, he's kicked in around 15 million. But there was a really intriguing headline on this, the real deal story about uh, the funding. And they said it was kind of like a slap and also a pat on the back. And the headline was, if they weather this storm, they'll be one of the leading companies in the space. So how can you unpack that one for me? Yeah, um, well, I have, I have pretty high conviction that we're going to weather the storm. Uh, and maybe I could provide some insight into, you know, some of the initiatives that the team has, has un, like, un, uh, right. put forward over the last couple of months to maximize our odds. And of course, like we know the world is extremely uncertain, so there's no guarantee, uh, but we feel re really good about where we are right now. So uh, our plan was basically as simple as, uh, you know, looking at the balance sheet and especially the, the cash line item and ensuring that we had, um, you know, the liquidity to, to, to weather really, really dramatic and deep and long drop in demand. Um, so we looked at everything uh, on, on, the ca on the cash flow statement. The first piece is generating, you know, e extra revenue. Um, and uh, that's efforts around extended stay, which are now about 75% of our, of our bookings. Um, so we've, we've recovered uh, a, a lot of a demand a drop, not obviously not nearly as much as where we were at peak, but um, that, that's really been helpful from a cash perspective. And then looking at every expense that we have, um, that starts with uh, the rents that we pay to our landlords or Saunders, primarily a business that leases our properties. Uh, we have some downside protections built into our leases that we started putting in in 2018, and that's tremendously helpful. But in addition to this, because of the unprecedented nature of the crisis, we've gotten a lot of support uh, from our partners and really, really substantial uh, concessions 
um, just given just how, how dramatic it is. Um, and, and, and they want to ensure that, you know, we're uh, in, a, in a great partnership for the long run. Um, other initiatives around like cost reduction touched everything. Uh, one I want to highlight is, you know, the most difficult decision the business has had to do. But on March 24th, we announced that we laid off a furlough about a third of our staff. Uh, we've also reduced salaries, we've reduced hours. Uh, so we've, we've taken, you know, the approach to cut deep and to cut fast uh, so that, um, you know, we're ready to bounce back uh, and, um, you know, don't have to do multiple cut, cuts. And, 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 and um, you know, there's this kind of famous slide from the Sequoia's um, RIP good times where they show, you know, if you cut shallow and slow, you have to do it multiple times and oftentimes consume more capital than if you were to just cut deep and cut fast and afterwards rebuild. And so that's the, that's the, the stance that we've taken. And then the last piece was, uh, you know, uh, thinking through how we can speak to our investors and, and hopefully get their support, which are kind of ongoing conversations. So many companies, uh, Sonder and Airbnb have pivoted to longer term stays. I feel like this webinar might've been called travels path forward, long-term stays <laughs> instead of short-term, uh, long-term stays instead of short-term rentals. Anyway, I'm sure you'll have a, uh, you know, a unique perspective on this. So we talked earlier about, um, you know, Michelle and John talked about how the leisure, you know, their leisure market is really bouncing back in Alabama states that are open. And there's been a lot of discussion, you know, who's going to lead the recovery hotels or short-term rentals. So you're a hotel company with a, you know, with foot in short-term rentals as well. You're in urban areas. What's your opinion on, who's going to lead the recovery? Is it, is it hotels? Is it short-term rentals? Is it a hybrid? What do you think? Yeah. So I, I, I don't think I have any groundbreaking insight here. There's a lot of really awesome research reports and smart people that have thought about the question in depth. And it seems like leisure, it comes before business. It seems like, you know, convention is going to be last. It seems like, um, you know, um, having a uh, contactless experience is better than a really packed property. Uh, so there's a few trends like that. It seems like, you know, a longer stay and drive by is going to be more important than, you know, destinations that are fed by international uh, demand. So uh, I think all these, uh, all these trends are true. You know, another thing I'd add on the extended stay piece is that, um, you know, it's, it's so unlikely there's going to be compression nights, you know, 92% plus occupancy nights uh, over the next six to 12 months, call it. Uh, and definitely as like just travel demand is depressed for the next several months, uh, high occupancy days are just out of the cards. And so it's rational for a player to try and think about having like a base of occupancy that's more long-term. Um, and it's not a compromise with the short-term guests. And so, you know, we're open for short-term guests when they feel comfortable traveling and when it's legal to do so uh, in most states. Um, but those can live in, in, in parallel. And actually that positions businesses that have a strong capacity to generate, you know, extended state demand uh, to drastically outperform, not just like during the, the crux of the trough, um, when, you know, state like use cases like medical workers or people are needing social distancing and so on, uh, really call for a 14 plus day uh, stay. Uh, but that can survive, you know, for the next 18, 24 months for how, as long, how, how long, however long the recovery uh, lasts is, um, you know, there's going to be an opportunity for businesses to kind of leverage a steady base of, of demand and occupancy to, you know, pretty dramatically influence RevPAR and the speed of recovery. So before coronavirus, what percentage of your business was uh, business versus leisure? And if leisure comes back first, how does that impact your business? Yeah, so uh, for us, it's about two thirds leisure, uh, one third business. So we overweight leisure uh, a little bit. Uh, that being said, you know, we think it's a pretty interesting opportunity for us to actually initiate conversations with, um, uh, with travel managers and to try and, and grow our, 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 our business footprint. You know, we really are high conviction that the best way to travel right now is in a contactless way. It's in a way where you have, you know, uh, a little bit more space to maybe order in some food and not eat in a crowded restaurant. So, you know, there's some businesses that really, really need, require business travel to thrive. Think about like a traveling enterprise salesperson uh, where it's really game changing if they're on the road for, for the success of their business. Um, you know, doing so uh, in a Sonder, we think is, is a really awesome opportunity. We have like kind of the, the amalgamation of like the really high cleanliness standards um, and the professionalism and the standardization uh, together with, you know, a contactless experience for a space that, you know, the majority of the time is much bigger, that has a kitchen, that has washer, dryer, uh, that's more appropriate for longer term stays. So uh, we think it's a pretty compelling value proposition. So even though it might be, you, know, you might think that, hey, just let's postpone plans to increase our kind of B2B business, this might actually provide an opportunity to, uh, to have business travelers, you know, stay in a much more safe, comfortable environment.
So you mentioned contactless stay, and Michelle was talking earlier about the fact that uh, she found that um, people that were booking vacation rentals were way less concerned about uh, cleanliness than, than she had envisioned, that she wasn't getting the phone calls about you know, sanitation and that kind of thing. Um, do you think it's overblown? It sounds almost heretical to, to say that, that yeah. that issue would be overblown these days. Yeah, well, isn't my guess is that better cleanliness can't hurt. And so at a minimum, you know, it's, it's slightly better and it might be much better for some subset of demo, for some demographics in particular, as you go towards like more conservative, uh, you know, pockets of demand like business travel, like managed travel, you can't take risk there. And so the cleanliness standard that there's a reason why, you know, Hilton is working with, you know, some brand names to figure out how they can have a, a comprehensive cleaning program. Um, you know, it, it actually does move the needle, I think, for some for some customer segments. Can we talk about business models a little bit? So your model is to, um, you know, to, to do these master leases with developers and property, you know, uh, landlords. Um, and so, and you mentioned that, I think you mentioned that some, that you negotiated some downside risk. So does your, does your business model change now? Because the fact that you're in, you know, locked into all these leases, how to put a lot of pressure on the company. Is there a, an altered business model going forward? Yeah, I think, um, the, the leasing model certainly is uh, risky uh, if, if taken, um, you know, in its, in its traditional way. Uh, I think there's opportunities to innovate on these contracts. A lease, lease agreement is a 50, 100 page contract. There's a lot of things that could be negotiated in there that will, um, you know, uh, protect us. Um, and, uh, we, you know, we started working on these, on these, on these mitigants, on these downside protection clauses uh, in 2018. And 80% of our leases, the leases that we hold today have a recession driven reduction in rent. Um, that's really substantial. And so those are kicking in, they should kick in in July once we have two consecutive quarters of negative GDP growth. Um, but in addition to that, you know, uh, our, our, our landlords we work with are really reasonable people and they care about our success in the long run, especially given that now our model is really full buildings, like ho hotel licensed full buildings. And so we're a really important tenant Like they want to see us succeed in that location for a long time. And so even beyond the contractual obligations, especially in a crisis so dire, um, you know, they're being cooperative. And so, you know, there's what's on the paper and there's the lease obligations. And then in practice, there's you know, what actually ends up occurring. And so I think, you know, the positive, the optimistic stance is that, well, at least, you know, the leasing mall will be market tested and, you know, a drop of demand that hasn't seen, hasn't been seen in over a hundred years. Um, and so there, there might be more confidence in the leasing model after this, if done the right way. Uh, and, and there's going to be uh, potentially, you know, uh, if, 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 if some companies have been a little bit less careful, it could, it could be devastating. And so it's, it's a pretty risky model, uh, but one where we think, you know, if, uh, especially if, if, if we keep innovating on the downside risk. So our, our original construct was a negative, uh, a, a technical recession. Uh, now, you know, in the next 24 months, it's not so much about a technical recession. It's about, uh, you know, understanding the shape of the RevPAR recovery curve. And so uh, our team is thinking through and speaking to property owners about what it, what it might look like for us to have, you know, downside protection that's built, that's, that, that revolves around the, the speed of the recovery. And so we're constantly going to be trying to innovate so that, you know, the leasing model can shine. We think it's, a, it's, it's really powerful if, it done, if done well. Uh, we've got one minute left. So um, Brian Chesky of Airbnb talking about, you know, the pivots they're making said, um, he didn't co-found Airbnb to become a real estate company. So do you think there's going to be a backlash against companies like yours that you know, leverage real estate and are essentially a real estate play? Um, you know, it's difficult to interpret what that, what that comment means. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, it just underscores the difficulty of actually running a real estate, like, you know, moving atoms around and it's a difficult task. Uh, and it's one that, you know, we've really committed to now for six plus years at, at building capabilities around that task. Um, and so uh, I think it's not so much like saying, hey, this is not a good business and we don't believe in it. Rather, it's like, hey, this is different. And, you know, Airbnb is a really strong marketplace and, you know, it believes in um, and, and, and it is highly capable at, at, and best in the world at a lot of things. And, you know, I think that was potentially, you know, uh, indicating the fact that, that real estate isn't one is going, isn't going to be one of those priorities and it's a need for to refocus the business. So I, I thought that was a, that was a clever comment. And I think, uh, you know, 
we really appreciate the partnership we have with them. They're one of our main partners. Um, and uh, this kind of further clarifies what the swim lanes are going to look like. Sure. Hey, we're out of time. This went fast. Thanks, Francis. <laughs> Thanks so much, Dennis. Take this. Thank you, Dennis and Francis. Uh, I've launched another quick poll uh, prior to our next discussion. So uh, you can vote on that now. Let me introduce this next conversation. Uh, we have a discussion around accelerating tech's role around cleaning and safety. Uh, this conversation will feature the founder and CEO of Breezeway, Jeremy Gall, and the founder and CEO of Properly, Alex Nigg, in conversation with senior travel tech editor at Skift, Sean O'Neill. Hello, uh, property owners and booking brands like Booking.com are going high tech in their effort to make sure that property owners comply with new uh, concerns and protocols around safety and cleanliness. Um, technology can fill in some of the dots, but the industry needs to rethink some of its processes. Uh, to walk us through this are two guests. Uh, Jeremy is founder and CEO of Breezeway. Breezeway is a platform that helps operators coordinate, vet, and verify the cleanliness, safety, and quality of their properties. About 500 uh, rental operators in the U.S. and more than a dozen countries uh, use Breezeway's services. We also have Alex, uh, founder and CEO of Properly. Uh, Properly uh, provides a quality management solution and a certification platform. Uh, it helps properties uphold essential standards for cleaning, disinfection, and maintenance, and Properly is backed by Accor Hotels uh, and some other investors. Uh, so thanks for your patience with those intros. Uh, let's dive into this question. You know, cleanliness may be uh, a bigger concern now for travelers. So Jeremy, if you could start first, you know, how does this potentially change the game for rental operators and owners? Yeah, I think it's, you know, uh, what we've seen is this sort of push for quality in vacation rentals has been going on back when I was at Flipkey in 2010. This is just another step. I think COVID-19 is really highlighting what needs to happen in the vacation rental industry, which is this continued push to take a lot of fragmented inventory and really improve the quality. So from a cleaning perspective, you know, the, the spotlight is on. Uh, and it's on how clean and safe are these properties and are they ready for travelers to come back? Uh. Okay, Alex, so we, we've had this audience poll and about 56% uh, of people are saying that uh, an independent certification or verification of cleanliness across properties is something that they, they feel is important for messaging right now. Um, but on the other hand, we heard earlier from Michelle talking about how in Alabama, a lot of the whole home vacation rental people, she's a property management provider down there. She says she's not hearing very many queries about cleanliness. So how, how big of an issue do you think cleanliness is? Yeah, I think um, Michelle's comment surprised me. And I think if anything, it's probably a testament to how they've um, been very consistent and very well regarded as a highly professional operator and have actually marketed their cleaning standard um, extensively for a long period of time. So I think she's the exception that proves the rule. Um, every piece of uh, research that we've seen is that, uh, and that's from listing platforms um, as well as from customer surveys, um, has is showing that um, interest in cleanliness and sanitation have spiked drastically. There is a massive increase in that interest. Um, and um, because of that, obviously, um, everyone in the industry is um, putting their best foot forward, um, be that the hotels with Hilton's Clean Stay, be that um, obviously the listing platforms with Airbnb's enhanced um, cleaning initiative, and all of that is uh, obviously based on research. So I think the, the evidence contradicts what Michelle earlier on said. If anything, I think it's a testament of how good they've been. So their guests are not asking. That makes sense, Alex. Uh, you know, so I'd like to kick the tires a bit, Jeremy, on this notion about tech-based verification. Uh, are apps enough to really confirm that the work has been done uh, you know, from the rental operator's perspective or from the listing brand service perspective? How do you make sure... What is enough to make sure the protocols are being followed? Yeah, it's a huge challenge, Sean. I appreciate the question. I think that, you know, there's only so much you can do. Either you're going to put a camera on someone, you're going to watch them get their job done, um, or you're going to have to grab signal, you know, from the tools that you use to have confidence in, in, in what's been happening. It's the same thing. There's a lot of operators, you know, we just heard from Sonder, there's a lot of operators in this business, Michelle included, who are professionals who have been doing this really well for a long time. And they've got systems in place. We help them with some of them 
but systems to help understand exactly what's been happening. And I think it's about confidence in that clean. Apps can help you, you know, you can grab signal from the GPS location of where people are. You can use photo verification about what's happening. You can have people use really detailed checklists. Um, all, you know, parts of the arsenal to see exactly what folks have done. But what it really comes down to is training and running a really good program. And I think, you know, what we've seen from a survey that we're conducting on operations is it's really interesting. You know, 99% of managers agree that travelers have a heightened awareness around cleanliness. Um, a majority say that this is the most important thing, but 20% of them plan to make no changes to their housekeeping protocols because they've been, <laughs> doing, this so because they've been doing this well for a long time. I think it's really interesting. Yeah, that is really interesting, I think. You know, uh, Alex, you know, how are you integrating certification into your product? Yes, I mean, the way we think about it, there's really three pieces to a certification process. The first one is you have to announce the protocol or like you have to brand the protocol. And I think um, we're seeing that across the industry. Um, obviously, that's what's happening at the Airbnb level. Um, we're seeing many property managers, and I think Michelle earlier on talked about that they have a clean sheet um, protocol um, that are doing it themselves. The second step is you have to manage the certification, as in how do I know that the person at the end of the line, which is the cleaner, actually did what they're supposed to do? Um, I think that's the emperor without clothes in Airbnb's case right now, how do you manage a 40-page protocol um, by host at the station only um, when the host may be as many as four steps removed from the person that actually does the cleaning on site? Um, so obviously you need a chain of control, you need a system of record. Um, that's how we are positioned. And then the last piece um, is the actual certificate. And who issues the certificate? There'll be many, um, whether that's the listing platform. And obviously, so I think it's been a big surprise for many of us that the listing platforms are getting into operational details to that extent. That clearly is a testament to how big it has become as a brand, brand issue, as a as a existential issue for them, or whether that's the property manager, or whether that's a regulatory authority or local tourism board, um, there'll be many um, parties that issue the certification. What we think is the emperor needs to have close at the end of the day, which is um, how do we manage this entire system from beginning to end and can trace everything and have a system of record. And that's, um, that's where we think the complicated piece is, but that's also where the important piece is. That makes sense, Alex. So, uh, Jeremy, to go back to a point you made in the survey, you know, maybe one out of five of the people were not planning to take actions. For rental operators and owners who are listening to this, they may think they're overloaded on time management and demands right now. Uh, this economy isn't great for this coming year. Uh, how is it that they can fit in enforcement at scale in a practical way based on, on their limitations? I think they, we've seen a lot of folks take the time where they were, they were pausing and travel was really paused. We're seeing, you know, folks like Michelle in Alabama are just opening up. They're just seeing that happen now. Uh, the smart operators have taken this moment to relook at their protocols and understand what they're doing. And then layering in pieces of technology here is not, um, you know, it's, it's meant to be pretty simple. And it's really, I actually don't think many folks have too much choice. Despite, you know, times are tough. This is going to be the new normal, which is, um, you know, hotels have been doing this for a long time. It's, it's common in hotels. Uh, the majority of hotels run a, their front office runs on one technology and their back office runs on another. And short-term rentals and leisure operators are, are beginning to understand they really need to do the same. And this just pushes it one step further. Okay, uh, following up on that point that uh, Jeremy just made, Alex, what do you think that short-term rental owners and managers can learn from what the hospitality industry has done in standardization? I think hospitality industry has been very good at um, having standard operating procedures, and I think our industry at best has been mixed. Um, I think we all know that there's some really, really good professional operators, but that's not the standard. Um, there is no standard across the industry. We also haven't been good at communicating standards. Um, again, I think the sort of the Maya vacations, the sort of the leaders in this industry that have had higher, high professional standards are the exception, not the rule, um, particularly in the urban segment where it's been a little bit of the Wild West. Um, um, unfortunately, I think we live and die, um, all of us live and die by the industry's reputation. Um, so at the industry level, we have to move very, very quickly towards setting standards, communicating those standards, um, and then, of course, abiding by those standards. And I think at the individual level, like that's what each of us have to do, be very, very clear about what we're doing and how we're doing it. 
Yeah, so let's build on that with guest communications. Alex, how are you handling messaging both, you know, before and during stays or helping the owners, you know, uh, right now? Um, we basically, what we focus on it, there's a common standard. So what we, um, like, ultimately, I think this is a branding game. Um, so the brands, the platforms, the listing platforms, the property managers are the, are the ones going to be handling the communication to guests. Um, so what um, I think what needs to be in place is a system that gives them the ammunition to actually certify. Um, we've done a large pilot, or we're doing a large pilot since November with booking.com. And basically, that's really what, like, how that works is if anybody fails the standards, um, they um, are simply not gonna not going to be able to list, uh, meaning it's a yes or no kind of answer. Um, if you're on a platform, if you're part of a property manager's um, inventory, then you meet a certain standard of, uh, of quality. And if you don't, then you don't. And it's the property manager, it's the listing platform that communicates that to the guest. Um, of course, we then have all of the checks in there, like that's the cleaning score um, that's done on a, on an as, uh, on a per job basis. Um, and that gets transmitted to the, to the guests so they have peace of mind where they stay safe. That's a very interesting uh, case study with booking.com. Uh, and, you know, I mean, that's not your only, you know, online travel agency partner that you, you can work with. You've said to us when we were talking beforehand. Um, Alex, when it comes to guest communications, I mean, we had this emergency crisis. It's, there is a, a non-zero chance that there'll be another emergency at some point in the next 18 <clears throat> months. You know, how should guest communications be handled, you know, around that? And it's, um, I think that's, um, this is a new normal, as in people expect a heightened level of safety, um, they're now paying attention to this. So I think as an industry, we have to make sure that, um, like, this isn't about this current crisis, it's about all future bookings. And we have to ensure that guests understand that these places are clean to high professional standards, and it doesn't matter who did it, um, doesn't matter whether that's an individual owner, or whether that's a highly professional property manager, everybody's job is certified by an independent third party. Um, and then and that guarantee is passed on to the guests so they know that they can stay yes. safely. Right, that makes sense. And so, Jeremy, well, how are distribution channels such as the online travel agencies sort of, you know, how do you see them fitting into things at Breezeway? Yeah, I think the distribution channels have a need, you know, I alluded to this before, but they've had this need for a push to quality across their fragmented inventory for quite some time. And now it's time, this is one more step. I believe in the instance to professionalize that inventory and supply. And for them, it's about how do we showcase, you know, how do we show the quality of the supply that we're doing? I think it's really just like Michelle was talking about. Um, some of this is a marketing, some of this is a marketing exercise. A lot of it is an operate. Some of it's an operational exercise to make sure these properties are clean and safe. I think we don't want to lose the word safety in here. It's now, synonymous with cleaning, but safety is important. Um, and I think those channels are going to start to just show and provide more confidence about the quality of the listing. Um, I don't know if they'll really get totally involved in certification. I think it'll be more of, hey, look, we want to give you more signal about how this property is being prepared. And we've got the way that we're building the mechanisms to be able to include this. But all of a sudden, cleanliness and safety, preventative maintenance about this unit is just as important as the listing pictures and the amenities. So we're going to surface that information to you. So Jeremy, I'd like to just follow up on that. So that, that's from the distribution partners thing. As a final question, you know, how do you see software in the future? You know, you know, with the new normal, we've talked a lot about housekeeping, but what else do you see as like advances in services on tech for the rental sector? Yeah, I think that, you know, we got into this business, I got into this business after FlipKey because I think services and the experience at the rental is the key differentiating factor between supply and this marketplace. Highly fragmented. There's a really, really big difference between the way John Banzak and Michelle operate and the way an individual owner operates. Some of those owners are highly, highly professional and some are not. Uh, but it's going to be about the service and how technology can help you efficiently deliver that service in a really predictable manner. So sitting at the intersection, operations at the intersection of your locks and your guest messaging during the stay so that you can offer, make sure that people are, are um, having a good experience. I think that's really key. And that's going to be what, what separates the winners here and the losers. All right. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, Alex. I think we've run out of time, but it does seem like in a gold rush, sometimes the best way to make money is to be the people selling the pickaxes and shovels to the prospectors. And I think both of your companies probably have 
good futures ahead. Thank you both for joining us. Thanks Thank so you. Thank you, everybody. For our final panel discussion, uh, we'll explore the, competi the competitive advantages uh, that might be seen in the luxury market and the behaviors there for consumers. Uh, leading this discussion uh, will be Chief Brand and Marketing Officer of One Fine Stay, Amanda Diachinsky, and Founder and CEO of Mint House, Will Lucas. Moderating will be Skift Senior Research Analyst, Seth Borko. Well, thank you all for, for joining us and sticking with us today. Um, I think we've saved one of the best sessions for last. I'm really uh, honored to be joined today by um, Amanda Diachinsky. She's the Chief Brand and Marketing Officer at One Fine Stay, and by Will Lucas. He's the founder and CEO at Mint House. And so, you know, at first glance, these are kind of different companies, right? One Fine Stay is leisure focused. It's owned by hotel giant Accor. Mint House is a little more business focused, and it's, and it's a relatively a young uh, startup company. But I think what it's interesting that they both have in common is they're very focused on, well, besides being short-term rentals, of course, is that they're both luxury companies, very, very focused on the higher end of our industry, of our market. And when we look back in like 2008 at the financial crisis, luxury was one of the first markets to come back from that crisis. So that gets to the core of this, this session. So I want to just start by asking, you know, this time around, do you think luxury can lead uh, in the recovery and what's what's going to drive that. So maybe it's going to be to both of you. Maybe we'll start with um, with Amanda. What are you seeing in the in the industry? I mean, the we I think we do expect to see an increase in demand for private home and and villas, but you know we don't think that's just that's um, enough for you know the, the luxury segment. You know we we anticipate that they're going to be looking for additional brand reassurances such as consistency in in product and service you know, these very high quality housekeeping standards, you know, that personal service and support um, because people are going to need more help to understand where they can travel. Um, and also that, you know, we deliver a lot of tailored experiences and, and we're looking at, you know, how we can do that with, with social, distancing, social, social distancing. I mean, I, I've seen um, some research that says that, the, you know, the world traveled are more positive in their outlook. You know, I do suspect that they miss travel more because they, they do more of it and that travel is more of an integral part of their daily life. But they don't necessarily view it as, as a luxury. So the luxury consumer doesn't necessarily view travel as a luxury. So. Yeah, it, yeah, for the, the people who stay with us that tend to be quite well traveled, they're going into a destination and they're looking for you know, an authentic local experience, which is why they, they choose us. Um, and so, you know, for those people, you know, we see, you know, high propensity to take many trips. Um, we have a lot of law customers and I think you know, that's going to help us. All right. And, and Will, I want to start with just the same question to you about the higher end of the market. How are you seeing your business recover at the higher end versus perhaps how others might be doing? Um, yeah, so we have a, uh, just a, a different segment of the market, of course, being in urban centers. So yeah. all, our, all our locations are uh, basically as close to the city center as, as we can as we can get them. Uh, so, yeah, when when higher end customers do come back, they're going to have a choice, um, whether it's for leisure or for business, they're going to have a choice between a short term rental accommodation or a high end hotel. Uh, so we think that the short-term rental category in urban areas is actually very well positioned to be able to capture that travel when it does return. You know, the average hotel room, of course, is is built uh, really with two functions in mind. It's a place for you to sleep and it's a place for you to to, to shower and get ready and, and, and use the bathroom. And and, and so in, in, a, in a COVID world, uh, you really need to offer an amenity rich experience on top of the contactless check-in that, that we have that many people have touched on an amenity rich experience in the actual unit that allows you to perform a number of functions and, and enjoy yourself and, and eat and drink coffee inside the room uh, rather than having to go out into the outside world. So, you know, I think the short term rental as, uh, industry as a whole in urban areas is actually very well positioned to capture that travel when it does return. Can I, can I maybe push you for some specifics of what, how exactly you respond to offer those amenities? Does technology have any role to play in it? Does, is it what kind of services are, are you going to be offering? Yeah, good question. So, you know, our, our business was, was actually 
pretty well positioned for this, not that we, we could have ever or anyone could have predicted this, but, but very well positioned for this environment. And so uh, as many other short-term rental operators provide, we have contactless check-in, we have uh, but on top of that, we offer digital concierge services and always have. So if you, you know, rather than asking anyone in the front desk, you can log into our app and uh, you can message any of our digital concierge uh, attendees. Uh, we also offer customized fridge stocking. So you can actually pick out what you want for your, uh, in your fridge upon arrival, either through SMS link or through the app. Uh, we did offer and still do offer uh, on-demand massages. We, so we think that uh, the additional services that we're going to have to add in this period would be a replacement for uh, the on-demand in-person massage. And, and instead, you know, we're working on a partnership with some meditation apps, some yoga apps, uh, things of that nature to try to replicate those other services and amenities that are no longer as desirable in this environment. And you guys were kind of tech heavy from the beginning, right? Like a lot of the stuff you're talking about, you're already doing. That's, that's exactly right. So I think, um, you know, our goal from this point on is to, to continue to add to the suite of amenities that are available uh, on your phone. And so we, we've always said from the beginning, we like to power the entire high touch hotel experience entirely via technology and provide all of the services that you would find in a high end hotel in the palm of your hand. And so uh, I think this event is only uh, accelerated our need to add more and more services um, because folks are going to be spending, of course, more and more time in the rooms uh, than they otherwise would when they're staying with us. So then I guess back to you, Amanda, I, I, I think it's an interesting contrast because um, One Fine Stay has been very much about the, the personalized element of luxury and that higher end experience you have, you know, in-person greeters. So is the, uh, the human touch, you know, pun, a bit of a pun intended there, is that still something that the, the luxury customer is going to want in this environment? And, and how are you responding? So, I mean, absolutely. I mean, we, we help the, our guests before stay. And, you know, mostly that's done online or on the phone anyway. So we don't see any, any changes uh, there. You mentioned our, our meet and greeters. So we do welcome all guests in person. Uh, and that's still a very important part um, of our experience. So that will continue, but with um, social distancing in play instead. Um, and obviously they'll be wearing masks and, and, and gloves. So it will look slightly different. Of course, we'll have to adapt, but we still see that as a fundamental part um, of, of our business. You know, speaking to a human, we offer a 24 hour support to our, our guests and stay. So there's always, you know, someone there to ask, ask a question. So we're there. Um, yeah. Absolutely. And I've heard you say before that you think travel is going to be a much more complex experience going forward. So that, that helps with that? Absolutely. So, you know, in this new world, um, I think there'll be more reliance on companies that can do more for, for guests to help them with their stays. At the luxury end, um, you know, they do demand more services. Uh, so, you know, it's going to take longer to understand which destinations are open or not, which ones are still, you know, in, uh, you know asking for quarantine times. You know, what are, what's everybody's cancellation policy? You know, some might want to travel outside of peak. You're going to check the cheap cleaning protocols. Um, you're going to have to know what's happening in, in the local city. So you want to know, you know, talk to someone who's from there so you understand, you know, are the restaurants open? So I think that's very important. And you, and you mentioned cleaning. So I'm curious, and this, this will be for both of you, but maybe Amanda, you can start. You know, a large, high end experience, the higher end of the short term rental you differentiate it by elevating services that everyone offers. Now that cleaning is so high up on the list, how are you going to make cleaning? How, what's, what is luxury cleaning? What does high end short-term rental cleaning look like that's going to differ, that's a differentiator from what everyone else is doing? Uh, so, you know, we offer housekeeping with, with all of our stays and you know, we only hire professional housekeeping staff and we train them to luxury hospitality standards. You know, we control the end-to-end -end experience. Um, so we use our linens and our towels. You know, they're, they're cleaned by professional linen company, laundry companies. You know, what's changed is that we've had to put in some new protocols and, you know, and additional training. So um, our staff now wear, you know, single-use PPE, you know, with the gloves and the mask. You know, we, um, we've upped, you know, the amount of um, surfaces that we clean with disinfectant. You know, we, we're part of a core, so, you know, which is great because they've been conducting research 
into you know cleaning and what customers want and so you know we can plan our response around that uh, there's another initiative that a core have a have a launched with bureau veritas and you know we have scientists advising and the idea is to have you know global um a global standard and that it's going to be independently verified. So, you know, we're looking at that very closely. Verification. Well, I, I wanted to give you a quick second to respond to that cleaning question as well. And I, I have a follow up for you about your business model. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so exactly, we're doing a lot of the same thing. So retraining our, our staff, uh, making this a top priority. So the first thing that, that our managers are, are, are speaking about, uh, implementing the, the PPE, of course, uh, gloves and masks for all of our employees and a real emphasis on cleaning surfaces using the, the right materials, uh, the, the right chemicals. Um, and, and so I think that's 100% necessary. And, and of course, because this is a, you know, it's a, it's a very serious virus and, and we're talking about people's health here. I think it also importantly is the need to communicate that effectively to your guests. Uh, we've all received emails from every single CEO of every airline, every hotel we've ever used, every rental car company we've ever used about the enhanced cleaning standards that they're doing. And uh, you know, at this point we're kind of, uh, we've, we've seen it all and, and are no longer really listening. So really getting that message across. And so to that point, uh, you know, we're putting a lot of things in the room that remind our guests of the extra cleaning procedures that we have gone through. Uh, our cleaning folks are, are, are visible more than they otherwise would. Um, and we're actually exploring some, some pretty cool cleaning technologies as well that we're, we, we're, we're considering deploying in our room. So pretty expensive pieces of equipment uh, that you actually leave in the room uh, after a checkout and you let it run for a few hours and it's proven to kill any and all viruses or, or bacteria that might be in the air. Um, and so, you know, things like that to really, really demonstrate that we're going the extra mile. And um, so, yeah. The no, I, I, lo I love that answer about, about physical reminders because I do, I do, it's a great point you made because I, I am just now deleting these emails and I get, you know, my whoever reaches out to me. I haven't spoken to this brand. I'm communicating forever. Um, I wanted to ask you, well, about, about, you said expensive units and the, and the stuff. I want to talk about a little about your costs and your business model. Now, you've been a big proponent of the, or participant in the master lease model. Very, um, you know, very sexy before this crisis, but now, you know, people are a little worried. You have this fixed cost structure. I just wanted to ask you, this is a little change talk, but like, are you paying your rent and, and how are you going to uh, adjust to that, that cost environment? Is that model dead or is it going to change? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, you're absolutely right. We, we did get our start in this business using the, the master lease model. Um, and in some cases we are still signing a master lease here or there. Um, and, you know, we're 100% still paying our rent. I think we're, we're, working with all of our landlords, much like everybody else is, to restructure our agreements and uh, potentially and get a, a little relief uh, in some cases as well. We're also working with our owners to, to switch to a management contract deal. Uh, this is really what we have been signing and working on uh, for over a year. And so most of our uh, new inventory has, has been signed under a management contract agreement. Uh, we think that this is the, the way of the future. We think this is the right business model for this category. Uh, it aligns interests between ownership and Mint House, the operator, uh, in a way that, that ultimately provides for a better guest experience. But, but also on the financial side, I think this, this event is, is really uh, demonstrating some of the limitations of the lease model, which is that how do you strike the right exact lease dollar amount that is a, a decent sharing of risk between the two parties? Because if you strike the lease too, too low, the operator or mint house is, is now taking way more of the risk, uh, way more of the upside that, than we think is fair. Uh, on the other side, if the lease is too high or there's a macro event like this one, then, then the whole lease is in jeopardy as, the, as maybe the company won't be able to meet their obligations. And so, uh, we, we think a management contract deal actually appropriately shares that risk reward between the two parties and provides for a better longer term relationship. It'll be interesting to see how that, that plays out. 
Um, we're, we're coming up on our clock, but I, I think I have one more t time for another question. And then it's gonna, I think maybe we'll, you'll both have a chance. I'll go back to Amanda to start with. I want to talk to you about uh, distribution and your channel partners. Um, Will had touched on the idea of communication. I know you, Amanda, have been, or you're a great communicator. And you've been very focused on communication as well. So I'm curious, I know, I know how you're communicating, maybe tell us a bit about it, but how do you make sure that your communications and the trust that you have in your brand gets, gets you know, transfers through, your, through Expedia, through, uh, through booking, through whoever you work with, through travel agents? So, I mean, our, our largest channel is direct bookings and that's because, you know, we're a hospitality company and, you know, we advise uh, our potential clients on choosing the right home and organizing their stay. So um, obviously we can do that very directly um, with, with, you know, if people come direct. Um, our second biggest channel is travel agents. And we've already seen uh, a, a growth in this segment. So, you know, we do think that, uh, you know, our premium customers will rely um, more on them. Uh, mm -hmm. And in particular, um, we're quite interested in attracting new guests um, and they'll trust our travel agents. They'll trust their, their travel agent to recommend us. So that's where, in, you know, we're doing some training next week with 400 luxury travel agents um, about our brand. But obviously, you know, our cleaning protocols are going to be front of mind um, there. <laughs> I, I like that you are, um, I think it's interesting that this is like a chance for the luxury travel agent to kind of strike back a bit. Yeah, absolutely. I think people are going to need more handholding, um, especially at, at the luxury end. It's going to be so complex to know where to go um, and how to get there, um, for sure. I mean, on the OTA side, you know, we we use our brand um, in within the OTA so that people know that when they you know they book with us, what experience they're going to have. I mean, the new thing for us is that we're looking at some longer stay specialists um, because obviously yeah. we, we have a you know a role to play there. Um, and so I think we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, and we'll kind of wrap with a bit of the same question to you. I'm curious how you are working with your, your channel partners and what you're seeing there. Um, just in general, maybe just general business trends, what, how you work with your partner as well as like length of stay, occupancy, booking stats, how you're seeing your business change. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, in a pre-COVID world, our average nightly stay is under three days. Um, and today our average nightly stay is, is actually around 21 days. So we're, we're driving in a, a number of bookings that are a couple of weeks and then even a couple of months. Um, and, you know, we've, we've been pleasantly surprised with, with our success driving this, this new type of demand into our unit. So uh, to illustrate that, you know, at the end of March, we were in single digits occupancy for April. Um, you know, our bookings fell off a cliff. Our cancellations went through the roof. Uh, we were actually so able to convert our, our, our sales team to, to target this longer term demand. Uh, we had success with traveling medical professionals, traveling nurses or medical professionals that were unable to uh, or didn't want to go back home, displaced college students and also our corporate partners that have uh, close down their offices and have employees that are unable to work effectively at home. So we're actually using our units as, as work, as workspace during the days. And so by the end of March, we actually were able to get our occupancy up to around 50% uh, for April. Uh, and then for, for May, we're around 50% and, and, and inching upward every day. So. Uh, are you kind of hopeful for the future, the post-COVID world? You know, you know, revenue, of course, is, is still down significantly relative to pre-COVID uh, uh, projections. Uh, but yes, I, I think we're, we're feeling a lot better than we were at the end of March when we were, when we were staring at a totally bare calendar. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, I think we've, we've also had some very encouraging progress with a number of our corporate partners and actually have signed quite a few uh, Fortune 100 companies in the last couple of weeks. Uh, many of them have been citing the relative safety and some of the things we've already talked about as compared to the, the hotel alternative. So, you know, we're by no means out of the woods yet on the revenue side, but, but certainly some very encouraging progress. Yeah, and Amanda, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you the, actually the last word. Um, I want to ask, how are you feel? Are you hopeful about the future of the industry? Maybe there's some positive changes you can you can see coming, or what are your your what's your outlook? 
Yeah. Um, I mean, we've always, what we offer has always been a good choice for, you know, for families. And I think now that people haven't seen their families, you know, those intergenerational holidays, I think, um, is an opportunity for us. Um, I mean, the, the biggest opportunity for us, I think, is that, you know, if with the downturn in the economy, that we might have more interest from homeowners. So it's a chance for us to grow our portfolio. Um, we've seen that previously. So that's good news um, for us. I think we, it's interesting because we do already offer a lot of in-home and additional services. And I think what we'll see is just a drive to, you know, there'll just be more in demand. So for those private chauffeurs, those private chefs, you know, people being able to, you know, import a gym, um, you know, a cinema experience. So it's not just the facilities, but the services coming in. Um, and we're now looking at, you know, being able to d- deliver, you know, parties in our homes and in, in our villas because, you know, people will still want to celebrate their milestones. They just might need to do, do it differently. And so I think it, it is a chance for us to potentially, you know, grow what we offer um, in light of those consumer you know, changes. Well, um, Amanda and Will, thank you so much for joining us. You've given me a lot to think about it, and I think the rest of the, the audience as well. So thank you so much for taking time out of your day to join us. We really appreciate it. Great. Thanks, Seth. Thank you, everyone, for joining us for today's Travels Path Forward Online Summit. Uh, thank you, of course, to all of our speakers for sharing their perspectives today. Once again, we'll be sharing a recording of this webinar later this week via forum.skiff.com. You can also view all of our continuing crisis coverage on the industry on skiff.com. Uh, and we are hosting our uh, Skift Forum Europe event as a virtual conference on June 30th. We hope you can join us. Thank you again. We hope to have you join us again for another Travels Path Forward online summit series.